Happy Pi Day! What is Pi Day? Well, hopefully, you're remembering from school we have this constant called Pi, and it's a lowercase Greek letter, sounds like our letter P, and you probably remember that we said Pi is approximately 3.14. Now, aside from that being a terrible approximation for Pi, it has stuck in the minds of everybody, and we recognize 3 for March, and the 14th, March 14th, we celebrate Pi Day every year. A mathemati mathematician nerd's dream come true. But it gets even better. I'm going to write out the next few decimal digits of Pi. Pi is approximately 3.141592653 dot dot dot. It keeps going. And that's a truncated value of Pi, not rounded. But as I look at each of the subsequent digits, I think, okay, March 14th, 2015 at 9, 26, 53, we'll just call it AM, we're thinking 24 hour time. You guys, this is Pi Day of the Century, the ultimate Pi Day as you can tell by my shirt. This happens only once every 100 years. This is the greatest Pi Day of the century. It seems to be a great year for me to start my YouTube channel. So my nerdism is up. Let's figure out what is this thing called Pi. And let's learn a little something. OK, so what is this number pi? Where does it come from, and why is it so important? Well, let's just start with the basic definition of pi. To start with that, we start with geometry. And we go with the simplest version of geometry, what's called Euclidean geometry. This is geometry in a flat space, or in this case, a two-dimensional plane, like my whiteboard is. And we start by defining a point. This point becomes known as the center. From this point, we extend a line segment. And we say that this length is length r, which we ultimately call the radius. And then we think, hold the center steady and rotate this line segment around the center. And from this end point, trace out all the points that it covers. So this will not be perfect, but it will essentially look a little something like this. And we say that all of the points along here make up what's called the circle. Now we can measure a few things about this circle. One easy one is something called the diameter. We've already got the radius. A diameter says take any point on the circle and draw a straight line to the other end of the circle, but pass through the center. Okay? This is what's known as the diameter, or D. We can also measure all the way around the circle. So I could maybe lay a piece of string as nicely as possible all the way around this outside edge until I come back to where I started. And then I could straighten out that string, lay it next to a ruler, and say, how long is that? And that's what we call the circumference, or capital C, of the circle. Now, something that was assumed by pretty much every ancient peoples is that all circles are similar. Now, what do we mean by similarity or similar? Well, let's go with another example here. I'm going to draw a different circle. So here is a secondary center. In this case, I'm going to have a smaller radius. And then I draw my circle around this center here. And I can measure this. I'll call this radius R2. And we'll call this one R1. We'll call this D1, not 2. We'll call this C1. But I can measure all the same properties here. So I can measure a diameter call it D2, and I can measure a circumference, and I will call this C2. So they're all different lengths. This diameter is different than this one, this circumference, this radius, they're different. But if they're similar, then their ratios must be the same. So what does that look like? Well, let's take this ratio here. I'm going to take the circumference of this left circle and divide by the diameter of the left circle. That's just a ratio. And I'm saying that if they're equal, then I can take the circumference of this second circle and divide by the diameter of this second circle, and I should get the exact same value every single time. That's what I mean by similar. It's actually not easy to prove that circles are similar. It actually does involve a little bit of calculus. You have to take limits, which we've talked about in previous videos. But it has been proven that it's true, and it was accepted to be true in the past. So it wasn't wrong to make that assumption. And so therefore, they are, in fact, similar. Therefore, these ratios are, in fact, correct. 
And because these were both very important measurements of circles, then this ratio became a very important number. And ultimately, we came to call it what we now know as pi. And so that is the definition of pi. Pi is the ratio of any circle circumference to its diameter. So what is that value? Well, your calculator may tell you now, but let's think back into the past. How did they calculate it, and what did they come up with? The earliest written record that we have of knowledge of the value of pi, or an attempt to calculate it, comes back to the ancient Babylonians, somewhere between 1900 and 1600 BC. Now, there are some people out there that will say the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is older than that, uh, actually might involve some pi in its calculations, but we have no evidence to support that, and it may just be a coincidence that you can take certain dimensions of the pyramid and calculate something that's related to pi, and actually it likely is and I don't want to be labeled a conspiracy theorist. So, we'll start with the ancient Babylonians. What was their first attempt at pi? Well, they were able to come up with pi is approximately, they said about 25 eighths. And written out as a decimal, this is 3.125. Now I've left my approximation of pi up here for the ultimate pi day, so we can compare kind of how close they were. We then have a record um, in ancient Egypt around 1850 BC where they calculated pi to be approximately 16 ninths squared. And if we write that out as a decimal, that's about 3.1605. All right, so we've got a low estimate and a high estimate. And then we can turn to Indian mathematicians. Around 600 BC, they calculated pi to be approximately, this one's a little more complicated, and I'd be kind of interested to know where they came up with this, but this is what we have, 9,785 over 5,568 squared and written out as a decimal, this brings pi to about 3.088. Now, of course, that's truncated, but uh, very, very low estimate. So like I said, I'd be curious to find out where they came up with that, but interesting nonetheless. Um, around 150 BC, Indian mathematicians found that it would be fair to say pi is approximately the square root of 10. And we can see that when we write out its decimal, as it's about 3.1602. A little high, but kind of neat. Square root of 10, very easy to construct, so not too difficult to get close to the value of pi. Um, there is even a vague reference to pi in the Hebrew Bible. Um, written somewhere between the 8th and the 3rd centuries BC, it talks about this, um, uh, I guess, bowl in Solomon's temple where they said the span, or the diameter, is 10 cubits and the distance around is 30 cubits. Well, distance around divided by span, or circumference divided by diameter, that seems to imply pi is about 3. So far the lowest approximation of any up here. Now, in AD 150, around then, Rabbi Nehemiah attempted to explain this, and he said maybe kind of picture the bowl like this. You know, you've got the very, very outside, but then there's a thickness to that edge that's also on the inside there, and that maybe the span measurement went from outside to outside, but the distance around, or the circumference, was this little inside part measured around there. Personally, I don't think the writers were too concerned with being mathematically precise, but that was his explanation for it. Turns out he was a mathematician himself, and he calculated pi to be approximately 3 and 1 seventh, which if we write that out, that's about 3.1429. So not too bad. And in fact, when we get to the section on rational, approximation, rational approximations, we're going to see this is one of the better rational approximations for pi. Um, after this, some of our next approximations for pi pretty much all came from China. Uh, in China, around 1 AD, we have a record that we are that they are showing pi to be approximately 3.1547, and 
have no idea where they came up with that, but that was what they've got. Um, about 100 years later, 100 AD, they also came up with this one right here, square root of 10. Um, in the third century, they found this rational approximation. Pi is approximately, let's see, we've got 142 40 fifths, which written out as a decimal is approximately 3.1556. So even bigger than the one from 100 years earlier. But remember, at this point, we don't actually know the value for pi. Um, and then we're going to start to kind of blend two different cultures here. We're going to bounce back to the ancient Greeks, and then we're going to go back to the Chinese. Now, they probably didn't communicate about this, but they found a lot of similar things, and they applied them in different ways. So let's take a look and see how they calculated pi. Now, around 250 BC, a Greek man by the name of Archimedes, who was probably way too smart for his time, developed a way of calculating bounds on pi, meaning good upper and lower bounds on pi, using the geometry tools that were available. Now, the Greeks were very, very well known for their constructions. They were masters of just using a straight edge, a ruler without marks on it, and a compass to construct shapes. And ultimately, that's actually how they also constructed numbers. Their math, their algebra, was based on geometry constructions. And so the Greeks knew how to circumscribe or inscribe shapes and circles. And so if we take this idea of just a circle, somehow constructed, he says, well, it's very easy for us to construct an equilateral triangle, a triangle with all sides the same, inside of that circle, so that the vertices touch perfectly, as well as outside the circle. I could actually very easily create a triangle such that the circle is, we use the term tangent, it just barely touches the sides of this triangle. Now, the perimeter of these triangles is incredibly easy to calculate. Just add up the three sides, or better yet, take one side times three, because they're equilateral. So I know the perimeter of this triangle, and I know the perimeter of this triangle, and I can see that the circumference of the circle must be somewhere between. And of course, it's easy to measure the diameter of the circle. And so we create an upper and lower bound for the perimeter, or the circumference, and then we just divide by the diameter, and we create an upper and lower bound for pi. And Archimedes was famous for starting with this triangle, and then essentially he could keep doubling the number of sides. So you get six sides, a hexagon, then 12 sides, a dodecagon, and then 24 sides, and then 48 sides, and then ultimately he went as high as 96 sides. So he was able to calculate the perimeter of an internal 96 regular sided polygon and an external 96 sided regular polygon. And then he divided by the diameter of the circle to create upper and lower bounds for pi. And here's what he was able to find. He said that pi had to be greater than 223 71sts and less than 22 sevenths. It had to be somewhere between these two values. And if I write them out with um, a few decimal expansions here, we get this lower one is about 3.1408 is less than pi is less than about 3.1429, which we can see is correct. His logic was not flawed, and so he knew that this was a great um, boundary condition on pi. And notice how he got the first two decimal places right. And although it's not exactly in the middle, the next two, 1, 5, or rounded would be 1, 6, are definitely in between here. So he was really the first one to capitalize on that. Now, it's not that this method specifically came from Archimedes and went to the Chinese, but the Chinese also developed a method very, very similar to this. And I don't know if it's just that they had more time on their hands or what, but around 265 AD, uh, we have evidence that they, uh, a Chinese mathematician or group of mathematicians used a method very similar to this to construct a 3,072-sided regular polygon, both inside and outside the circle, and then approximated pi using those polygons. And they came up with pi is approximately 3.1416, which obviously is very accurate up here. Um, turns out that the um, Greek Roman man Ptolemy 
um, around 150 AD. Uh, we don't have the reason why, but he declared this was about the, the um, value for pi. Um, this was about 100 years earlier than the Chinese did it, so we don't know if this came from Archimedes or what, but this was what he said that the value of pi should be about. And then around 480 AD, we have again from China, we get this rational approximation here. Pi is approximately 355 over 113. And as a decimal, I'm going to write this out. It's about 3.1415. Nine two nine two zero dot dot dot. This is in never ending decimal. But take a look at how accurate this is. Three point one four one five nine two matches up to here. And then it's just slightly higher by a little under three uh, places at this place right here. And so this is incredibly accurate as a rational approximation. And in fact, this was the best approximation we had for pi for almost 800 years. Basically, it only got better than this when around the time we started to develop something called infinite series. Now before I get into that, we're going to talk about other ways of representing pi, but it just kind of goes to show that it's not an easy thing to find new ways of calculating pi. It's just more about determination. I'm determined to keep going until I finally get something really good like this. One way we have of studying numbers who have incredibly long decimal expansions is to instead focus on a way of representing them rationally or as fractions. And one such way is called a continued fraction, in which I have fractions embedded within fractions embedded within fractions. Now if it's just called a continued fraction here, I'm thinking of a simple continued fraction in which my numerator is always a 1. So if I look at this first example here, I've got pi equals, and notice that's not approximate, it equals this continued fraction where it's 3 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 15 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 292 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus and it keeps going and with a simple continued fraction where it's always ones in the numerator then we look for patterns in these numbers right here notice the 3 just represents the first number before my decimal point but it turns out that with pi there is no pattern and there never will be we're going to talk more about why later but there is no pattern to that. But we can have what's called generalized continued fractions, where I can have different values in my numerator. And for most numbers, if we're clever enough, we can find some sort of pattern to how those go. So I put my favorite ones up here all over the place. So here's the first one, where it starts as 4 over, and then notice these numbers here. I first have a 1, but then the rest are 2's, and that will continue into infinity. And then look at the numerators. I've got 1 squared, 3 squared, 5 squared, 7 squared, 9 squared. That's not a uh, mistake or a coincidence. That will also continue into infinity. And if I could go all the way to infinity, this would ultimately converge to pi. Same thing here. Here I start with 3 plus, like with the first one. But now here, notice every single thing that's being added is a 6. And my numerators also form a very similar pattern. 1 squared, 3 squared, 5 squared, 7 squared, 9 squared. No coincidence there, goes into infinity. And finally, up here in this corner, I've got, uh, similar to this one, it starts with 4 over. And then the numbers that are here are just the odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, which will continue into infinity. And my numerators go 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared. So it's all of the perfect squares continued into infinity. And this is just really cool to me. You know, these aren't things I've ever derived. You know, I trust that the people who found them found them correctly. But to be able to find these kind of patterns in this number, I just think that's really kind of cool. Let's look at how else we can find pi. Now, I said that in about 480 AD, the Chinese found a rational approximation to pi that would be the best approximation for about 800 years until around the time we discovered infinite series. That's not entirely accurate. There were still a few hundred more years after that where we did find better approximations for pi, but all of these methods actually involved continuing to use some form of Archimedes polygon method. There really was no better way available. and. Um, Finally, some mathematicians discovered this thing called infinite series, which ultimately did help make it faster and more efficient and more accurate. Now, we'll talk about infinite series in a little bit, but first, where did they come from? 
Most of them are attributed to two mathematicians in Europe uh, in the 1600s, of the last names of Gregory and Leibniz. But actually, Indian mathematicians found uh, infinite series somewhere between 1400 and 1500 AD. So they really were the first that we have on record. However, Gregory and Leibniz are attributed with being the first to apply infinite series to calculate values for pi. So we continue to attribute that to them today. So what are infinite series? Well, I figure we'll do this by way of example. Um, so we're going to use some notation we've seen before. We're going to use this capital sigma, Greek S for sum. Underneath, we pick a variable that we're going to index. So let's say I choose n, and I need to know its starting point. So I, ch I write n equals 0. That's my starting point. And my ending point, well, I'm going to write infinity for my ending point because it's an infinite series. And then I have some formula that I write after this. So let's say my formula is 1 over 2 to the n. So what does all this symbology mean? Well, written out, this means I'm plugging in each value for n up to infinity. So starting with 0. So plugging 0, then plugging 1, then plugging 2, then plugging 3, and so on and so on, and add each of those terms together. So to start, it would look like this. 1 over 2 to the 0, plus 1 over 2 to the 1, plus 1 over 2 to the 2, plus, and so on. I don't need to keep writing those out. Why is that important? Well, let's look at these values and calculate the first few partial sums. Well, 2 to the 0 is 1. 1 over 1 is 1. So this just starts out as 1 plus 1 over 2 to the 1. That's just 1 over 2, 1 half, plus 1 over 2 to the 2. That's 1 over 4, plus 1 fourth. You can imagine where it's going to go from here. It's going to then be plus 1 eighth, plus 1 sixteenth, plus dot, 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 into infinity. Now, I mentioned partial sums just a little bit ago. What do I mean by that? Partial sums are where I say, OK, add the first term, then add the first two terms, then add the first three terms, then add the first four terms, and so on, and compare that list and see what happens. So that's what I'll do next. So if I look at partial sums, I can think of it as a list or a sequence, because it's going to be an ordered list. And I say, OK, the first one is just 1. Then I take 1 plus 1 half. Well, that's just 1 and a half. Then 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth, that's 1 and 3 fourths. 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth, that's 1 and 7 eighths. Keep going, that's going to be 1 and 15 sixteenths. I could keep going, 1 and 31 30 seconds, and I know that's going to keep going. What I'm hoping that you'll see is that it looks pretty obvious these values are approaching a specific value. Look at this fraction, it's always the numerator is 1 less than the denominator. And this fraction itself is really, really close to 1 the higher I get. So adding that to this one, it appears that these are approaching the value of 2. And in fact, that is what's happening. And so we would go back to our calculus, and we would say that the limit of this sequence of partial sums is 2. And since that's the limit of the sequence of the partial sums, then we say that is the answer, that this sum converges to 2. So we can actually write this at the end, this whole thing equals 2. So I have an infinite series, an infinite sum of values that gives me a finite value in the end. That's the key thing. I could say I could never stop adding, but ultimately if I, if I could make it to infinity, then I would stop adding at 2. More mathematically accurate, I'm saying I can get as close to 2 as I want using this sequence. There is some value for n where, I, where the sum at that point will be within some sort of given threshold. I can get as close to 2 as I want. So the sum of this infinite sequence is 2. And that's what um, Gregory and Leibniz were showing, is that we can find sequences that can get us values for pi. How did they do that? Well, I don't want to get too in-depth here, but they're using something in trigonometry called the arctangent function. Now, you don't have to know what the arctangent is now. I do plan on doing some trigonometry videos in the future. But basically, with this function, we know some values. So, for example, we just spell it out basically, arctan for arctangent. If I take the arctangent of 1, I know that its value is pi over 4. And that's been known since trigonometry pretty much was known. Now, what Gregory and Leibniz were able to show independently was that given the arctangent function in general, so let's just call it the arctangent of z, then what we can actually think of this as as an infinite series. 
this is the same as z minus, sorry, I don't have it memorized, I gotta look it up, z cubed over three plus z to the fifth over five minus z to the seventh over seven plus on into infinity. They were able to show an equivalence between this infinite series and this function right here. Well, if these are equivalent, then I should be able to plug one in for z here and ultimately get that for pi. And that's true, and that's what they were able to do. So I can continue up here and say, well, just substitute one in for z, which means pi over four is the same as one minus, well, one cubed is just one, so it's just minus one over three, plus one to the fifth is just one, one over five minus one over seven, plus one over nine minus one over 11, plus on into infinity. So here we have a new representation of pi. pi. It's pi over four, but it is an infinite representation. And so ideally, as I calculate more and more into my series, I'm gonna get closer and closer to this value here. And if I want just pi, I just multiply by four. Very straightforward. Now, series by definition is a sum. It's things that we're adding. But we can have infinite products, things that we multiply infinitely. And it actually turns out there was a French mathematician in uh, 1593 who found an infinite product for pi. And so I wanted to share that one with you here too because I thought it was kind of neat. This was before the infinite series was really formally developed in Europe. But what he found was that I can take two over pi and say that is equivalent to the square root of two over two times the square root of two plus the square root of two all over two times the square root of two plus the square root of two plus the square root of two all over two on into infinity. So this one is very unique in that it's an infinite product and it's only based on twos. I thought that was kind of cool. Now here is the key thing about both of these formulas, this one right here, as well as this one right here, is they don't converge very quickly. In other words, in order for me to get close to the true value of pi over four or two over pi here, I have to extend this into the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, before I start to get four, five, six decimal places of accuracy. So it's nice, I'm finding formulas, but in and of themselves, they're not the best. This by far is the best of these two. This is gonna go faster than this one is, but it's still not very fast. But it shows that we have a new tool at our disposal. And it was with that, that future mathematicians were able to develop other formulas for pi. And let's explore a few of those. In 1706, mathematician John Mackin was able to take this arctangent function and put it together in a new way such that we could calculate pi a lot more quickly. And it looks a little something like this. Starts off kind of the same, pi over four equals, but then we take four times the arctangent of one-fifth minus the arctangent of one over 239. Make sure I got that right. Yep. And so what this basically does is it takes the same idea of Gregory and Leibniz, and so I've got this infinite series expansion of arctangent. And so I start by putting in one fifth for z here, which is calculable enough, easily enough, especially for having no calculators at the time. And go as far as you want, then do the same with one two thirty ninth. That's not as fun, but still very possible and relatively easy. And then just take whatever you get here, multiply by four and subtract whatever you get here and you get pi over four. Then just multiply that by four and you got pi. And this turns out to converge much more quickly to pi than just using the arctangent of one like Gregory and Leibniz did. And so we have a way of putting this stuff together to grow faster and faster representations. And it's formulas like this, and there are others where you can use different numbers here and different coefficients in front and different fractions of pi, but ultimately the same idea that will converge relatively quickly, some a little faster than others. That's what was used for quite a while after this to calculate better and better digits of pi. They just converge so quickly, that it, just, it just worked great. Now, um, there's another formula for pi that I just wanted to make sure I shared with you. I have no idea who came up with this or when, but again, I like patterns, I think it's kind of cool, so I think you'll like this one too. 
here we can say that pi equals 3 plus, now follow along, this is 4 over 2 times 3 times 4 minus 4 over 4 times 5 times 6 plus 4 over 6 times 7 times 8 minus 4 over, that should be an 8, sorry, 8 times 9 times 10 plus da da da. Okay. Hopefully that pattern's fairly easy to see. Uh, it seems kind of weird that that pattern would actually work, but as, as we can see, we've got three terms, be, three, three factors being multiplied here. They're sequential. Whatever the last one is starts the next one. I'm alternating plus and minus. My numerator is always four, and it just keeps going like that. This is, again, not a rapidly converging formula, but it does converge to pi ultimately. I just think that's kind of cool. Wanted to make sure I shared that one with you. The next one I want to share comes from none other than Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler, a man we've talked about multiple times and I will continue to talk about multiple times because he's just that important to the history of mathematics. But this was something that became known as the Basel problem and it essentially said, okay, if I have sums of reciprocals of squares of natural numbers, I know that it converges. I know that it approaches a specific value. But what I don't know is what is that value. And it was a problem that plagued a lot of mathematicians for a long time. And Leonard Euler was the first one to come along and give the answer to that. And it's non-obvious, but it's very beautiful. It's very elegant. He showed that if you were to go into infinity with this series, your ultimate answer would be pi squared over 6. That's right. Pi is involved in the solution to this problem right here. And it's not obvious to see why. I actually do plan on doing a video in the future to show where that number came from and why it's the case, but we're going to need a little bit of trigonometry background and then a little bit of calculus too beyond what we've already done. So it's going to be a ways in the future, but it's pretty cool that I take a, take a nice simple pattern like this and pi is completely related to that. But it gets even better. Hopefully this series looks familiar to you. When I did the video on the Euler product formula, we talked just about things like this, the reciprocal of, of powers of natural numbers. So here it's the power of 2, and we show that there's a formula for any power. We said the power of s. We called that function the zeta function. We're not going to spend a lot of time with it, but we said that it's equivalent to an infinite product involving prime numbers. And so this can be rewritten using the prime numbers, and it would look a little something like this. It would be 1 over 1 minus, I can't believe I've almost forgot, 1 over 2 squared times, follow the pattern, 1 over 1 minus 1 over 3 squared times 1 over 1 minus 1 over 5 squared, dot, dot, dot where the thing that I'm changing is this number right here, and I'm inputting all of the prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, and so on and so on. Those are the only numbers that I use. If I multiply that an infinite number of times, I'm going to get this exact same result that it's pi squared over 6. What I love about that is now we've got a deep and beautiful connection between pi and the prime numbers. Pi and the natural numbers may feel a little more natural, but to be able to link them to the prime numbers, I think is incredibly beautiful. I just wanted to make sure I shared that with you. Now, up to this point, there had been a big question about pi. All right, great, we've got formulas for pi, we can get some accuracy with pi, finally, we can prove it mathematically, not just measuring shapes we've drawn. But the question is, what is the value for pi? Granted, I can get nice approximations, but can I get the actual value for pi? Well, now we need to think back to my number class videos when we talked about different ways of classifying numbers. And one of the most important ones was to say the rational numbers, a number that can be written as a fraction or a ratio of two integers. And we said if it can be written as a ratio, then it's an exact number. And as a decimal, all rational numbers either terminate, they're just, the decimal number stops and we're good, or they go into infinity but they have a pattern that repeats into infinity. So the same series of numbers appears over and over again. That's what rational numbers are. And then we proved that very easily there are irrational numbers. The square root of 2 turns out to be irrational. 
and thus its decimal, although it does still go into infinity, can never have a repeating pattern. So the question becomes about pi. Does pi have a repeating pattern? Now, we've only seen this many decimal digits of pi, and so far there's no repeating pattern. But there's nothing that says a rational number can't have a pattern that repeats after 1,000 digits. That's very, very possible. Now, well, I'm not even close to 1,000 here, so I have no idea just by calculating that. And none of these approximations that I've used, or from previously, tell me for sure that there is no chance that it could possibly turn out to be a rational number. I may just not have calculated far enough. And it plagued mathematicians for the longest time because pi has always been approximated. We'd like to know an exact value. And it wasn't until 1761, Swiss mathematician Johann Lambert finally proved in and of itself pi is in fact irrational. There is no exact value for pi, and thus it goes on into infinity with no repetition as a decimal number. And so we now knew, we settled the question, pi cannot be known exactly. So our calculations for pi are only to calculate approximately its value. Now I would love to take the time to show you a proof that pi is irrational, and maybe I will at a later time, but it does involve upper level calculus, college level calculus, and um, would take a lot of space. I would have to fill up this whiteboard probably 10 times to ultimately get to that point. So I haven't yet decided if I'm actually going to do that or not. We won't do it here, certainly, uh, but you can look it up if you want to on your own or post in the comments. If you'd like to see me tackle that challenge, I'd be more than happy to. I've done it before. I'd be glad to try it again. But in the meantime, let's keep going with some more about pi. So where did the choice of pi come from for this number? We said that its origins, uh, the number itself, are the, is the ratio of any circle's circumference to its diameter, but what about our choice for its name, calling it pi? Well, all of the various ancient cultures that had derived that value for pi, none of them used the letter pi, mostly because most of them weren't Greek, and the few ones that were Greek also didn't use pi for that as well. To use a letter like pi to represent a number that was not a whole number made no sense to the Greeks. They would not have done that. So why do we use that to this day? Our best evidence comes from mathematician William Jones in 1706. He was the first one to use the letter pi, and we believe he chose that because he was using it as an abbreviation for the word periphery, which also means perimeter, which for a, circum for a circle is the same as circumference. And so P for periphery, P for pi, thus he used pi. Now that didn't mean that's, what, that's not the reason we used it, but that's the first evidence that we had. Turns out Leonard Euler, again a man I said I wouldn't stop talking about, liked that choice. And in two of his famous works published in both 1736 and 1748, he chose to use pi to represent that ratio, and it has stuck ever since, due to his popularity, because people looked up to him, they appreciated what he was doing, they recognized his importance, we now use that to this day. So that's where that comes from. Now, we learned pi is irrational. We could never know the exact value of pi. We've talked about how ancient cultures have approximated it through different measuring techniques, how we can use infinite series to get more accurate approximations, but what do we consider to be okay or good enough approximations? Just keep going with decimals? Well, it turns out in most situations, just keep going with decimal places is not the best way to get the most accurate. What we would prefer to do, and is usually better mathematically for calculation purposes, is actually to find what's called rational approximations. So rational numbers, again, are numbers that are of the form a over b, where a and b are integers, and b is not equal to zero. We know pi is positive, so we might as well say a and b are both positive, and we prefer to have our rational numbers in lowest form. So this is a fully reduced fraction. So what are some different uh, rational approximations for pi that meet that criteria? Well, the first one is pi is approximately 22 sevenths. That one has been known for quite a long time. Um, it, was, it was an accepted approximation even before Archimedes found it as an upper bound for pi. Um, and uh, we talked about Rabbi Nehemiah in around 180 AD calculated 3 and 1 sevenths. Well, that's the same as this, 22 sevenths. Uh, as an approximation for pi. This one is really close, and in fact, it's better than 3.14. The standard in American mathematical textbooks is to round pi to 3.14, 
and that is such a terrible approximation. I'm always disappointed when I see that because, and here's my biggest reason why, our infrastructure, roads, uh, buildings, bridges, all of them in some sense will depend on us calculating with pi. If we were to use 3.14, our entire infrastructure would collapse. It's that inaccurate. Now that doesn't mean 22 sevenths would be good enough, but it would last longer, our infrastructure would. Now I'm going to get off my soapbox, let's talk about a few more rational approximations. I talked about one that the Chinese found um, around 480 AD, and that was 355 113ths. This turns out to be an incredibly good rational approximation. In fact, it's so good that if I would think about, let's find the next best rational approximation. Well, let's start with this. If I were to think about any denominator lower than 113 and find the closest rational approximation to pi, none of them would be as good as this. So to find the next best one, what I do is I increase the denominator, and for each increase, find the numerator that corresponds to the closest rational approximation and determine if it's better than this one. And it turns out I will not find a better rational approximation until I get to this one. And that's right, 52,163 over 16,604. There is no better rational approximation than this value until I get all the way to this value. That just shows the power of how good that one is. And in fact, this one isn't even that much better. It's only better by maybe about one more decimal place of accuracy, and then the remainder is a little bit closer. That's about it. And so that's, this is an incredibly important one. And if you ask me, and nobody ever seems to, this is what we should be having our kids use as an approximation for pi. I think start out in elementary school using this one and then bump them up to this one. Because you want to know how our infrastructure would work if we use this rational approximation for pi? We'd be fine. Our infrastructure would be just fine. This is good enough. Now we want to talk about space exploration or we want to talk about particle accelerators and studying the micro universe. Well, then that's not going to be good enough. But for everyday experiences, absolutely. And it's much easier to work with than truncating pi after like six or seven decimal places. The math is easier to work with and it's accurate enough for that purpose. But again, I got back on my soapbox, so I should get off of that again. All right, so where do we go with next with pi? Well, speaking of how accurate do we need pi to be to be good enough, if I were to think about calculating the biggest number I would possibly need to, so I'm going out to the size of the known universe, or the smallest I would possibly need to. I go down to the Planck length, the smallest possible scale measurement distance. And then it turns out that whenever pi is involved, the maximum amount of digits I would need would be 39 decimal digits. And if I include the three in that count, then I'd say 40. Wouldn't need any more than that. And yet, we have taken the time to actually calculate pi to well beyond 13 trillion digits. So what is the purpose of that? To be honest, the purpose is for fun, as well as, truthfully, to test our computers. Now that computers are a big part of our society, where they have to do major calculations, we need to make sure, first of all, they don't make mistakes, and we also need to trust that we can program correctly, and it's a great way to test the math stuff that we're developing that requires a lot of calculations, does it get there accurately? So if we can calculate pi accurately, then we know that the machine is working like it should. But how do we program those machines? Do we take the time to use the arctangent uh, function as an infinite series? No. Although we can, it's not going to be very quick. It's going to take a lot more time than is necessary. What we actually use is a different type of formula. It's going to look a little bit crazy, but again, I love sharing this stuff with you guys, so that's why I'm doing this. The first time this was found out was by an Indian mathematician named Ramanujan, a man who died way too young because he was too poor and couldn't afford the health care that he needed. He got sick too often and had a way of seeing numbers that I don't think anyone before or after has. It was just amazing. To him, numbers combined together mathematically, just obviously and very quickly in his head. And my favorite thing about him is his way of proving stuff was to say, well, it's obvious, isn't it? Mathematicians spent years later going through his stuff 
to finally take the time to prove that it was true, whereas he didn't, because he didn't know how. He had no formal training. He just knew it had to be true. It just made sense. So he found this formula for pi. It's a little lengthy, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. Tell me what you think. It looks a little something like this, and I'm going to cheat with my paper here. Starts with 1 over pi equals 2 times the square root of 2 over 9,801 times the infinite sum for k equals 0 to infinity of 4k factorial times 1,103 plus 26,390k all over k factorial to the fourth times 396 to the 4k. Wow, that is insane. That's who Ramanujan was. I don't want to actually say he was insane, but that's what he could do. He could figure that kind of stuff out without formal mathematical training. That looks long and that looks complicated, but to a computer, that's not so bad. Think about what this is saying. Okay, this is just a constant. And this is an infinite sum. So I'm going to, for each k in here, I'm going to start with plugging in a 0 and then see what I get. Then plug in a 1 and see what I get. Then plug in a 2 and see what I get. Each thing that I get, I'm going to multiply by this and then add all that together. The beauty of this is that, especially for the first few values of k, this is very, very easy for a computer to calculate. And for, the first, for, for each value of k that I plug in and look at the partial sums, I'm actually getting about another five or six decimal places of accuracy with pi. So for k equals 0, 1, 2, and 3, I've already got more accurate decimal digits of pi than I have right here. And a computer can spit that out in seconds, if not less time, depending on the computer that we have. What year are we talking about? And here's what's even better about all of that. Ramanujan did that without thoughts of computers. He found this in 1914. Computers weren't even an idea at this point. And yet, this formula turns out to be one and one of this form that we plug into our computers today to calculate pi. Pi calculated out to 13 trillion digits was using a formula very, very similar to this. I want to show you one more very similar to this that was found by the, oh, let me see if I say this right here, the Chudnovsky brothers in 1987. It's of this same kind of form, and that's really one that's been used even more by modern computers to calculate pi. So let's take a look and see just how crazy this one looks. Whew! I need a break just from saying that and from writing that. Get a little bit of cramp here. Uh, but yeah, again, same form. We can see how it's very, very similar in form to what Ramanujan found. But with these larger numbers, it gets even more accurate. And in fact, here's how accurate it is. For every new value of k that I plug in, I'm going to get about 14 more digits of decimal accuracy with pi. So I plug in k equals 0, k equals 0, and I've already got a better approximation to pi than I have right there. That's just one term. I plug in two terms, and I've more than doubled that. And I plug in three terms, and I've almost quadrupled that. I mean, it just gets better faster. And again, this is something a computer can do very easily. And thus, you get supercomputers, which don't mind chugging away for days at a time or months at a time, as it sometimes is. And you can ultimately get values that will get you into the trillions of digits for pi. Again, not something that we need, but a great way to test how good our computers are, how fast they are, and how accurate they are, as well as a great way to test our programming skills. Now, there's one more formula I wanted to make sure I took the time to share with you today. And the reason I like this formula is because of how unique it is and what kind of different things we can do with it. This formula was found by a man named Simon Plouffe in 1995. And it looks a lot simpler than these. And it looks like this. Pi equals the infinite sum. Here he chose the index i from i equals 0 to infinity of 1 over 16 to the power of i times minus 1 over 8i plus 6. Now that's it. A lot simpler than Ramanujan's, a lot simpler 
than the Chudnovsky brothers, and not faster. If I use this in a computer, I'm going to go a lot slower than I am with this one. So what makes this one so unique? Oh, and by the way, i is not the imaginary constant, it's just a variable. Well, what makes this unique is actually focused right here with this 16. Now, everything we have been doing is talking about, when I say decimal, I mean something called base 10. Our number system is based on 10 digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay? But that does not have to be the case. We can do base any number that we want. And especially when we start thinking about computers, computers at their most basic think in terms of base 2 or binary. They just use two digits, 0 and 1. And we can talk about pi in binary, but I don't, we're not going to. Um, we can go a little bit further than that. Um, there are 8 bits in a byte, and so base 8, or octal, is another great computing uh, number base. And then we can double that as well to base 16 called hexadecimal. Now, how would base 16 work? We only have the 10 digits 0 through 9. Well, here's how we've decided to label them. So we can think about our usual 10 digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's 10 of them. We need a total of 16 digits. So then we have A, B, C, D, E, and F for the last six. So what does that mean? When I see the digit A, I'm thinking the value of 10 that I'm used to. This means 10 things. This means 11 things, 12, 13, 14, 15. So if I wanted to write the number 16 in hexadecimal, I would write it as 1, 0, because I would have 1 in the 16th place and 0 in the 1's place. All right. So hexadecimal is another number language that computers understand very, very well. Well, this formula for pi it can be called a spigot formula because I can actually, through a quick transformation of using this formula, I can actually find a specific digit in the hexadecimal expansion of pi. So let's say I want to know what's the tenth hexadecimal digit of pi. Well, there is a way that I can plug in 10 in here, transform it, and the answer that I get will be the tenth hexadecimal digit of pi. Spot on. And it doesn't matter that just don't just do it at 10. I can go to 100 or 1,000 or a million if I wanted to. Now, of course, the higher I go, the longer it takes to calculate it. But this can be thought of as like a check formula. So if I were to calculate, let's say, a billion hexadecimal digits of pi, and I want to know how accurate that is, well, I can use this formula to maybe calculate every 10,000th digit of uh, hexadecimal digit of pi and make sure that the every 10,000th hexadecimal digit from this formula lines up with the one that I used maybe from this formula here only in hexadecimal and make sure that they line up and if they are perfect at each spot then I can say that I must have done my, my uh, math correctly and that can be a faster way of checking it normally how we check to verify that we did this correct is to use a similar one like this and run it again well these two are going to have very similar run times so it's like saying, I'm going to do this twice and make sure I get the same answer both times. That's what that is. So it's going to double that amount of time. Whereas I could run this separately and check and make it a lot less time. And I'm checking an appropriate number of digits to make sure that I got it accurate. So this is a really, our explorations in Pi these days are really more about both fun and checking on our computers. How fast are they and how accurate are they and how good are we at programming them? But this is just more about Pi that I wanted to make sure that I shared with you. On to some more stuff. Now, I want to talk about another property of Pi, but it's one that's not very easy to explain, um, and it's, so it's going to involve a little bit of background, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, and it has to do with another classification of numbers. Now, in my number classes video, we found a lot of ways of classifying numbers, but there was one that I left out, and I left it out on purpose because it really wasn't necessary. It only shows up in very specific areas like what I'm about to talk about here, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce it now. This is what we call algebraic numbers. So what are algebraic numbers? Well, they're best to explain with an example, and algebraic numbers are defined based on polynomials. Well, what's a polynomial? Well, this is a polynomial right here. So take a look at what we have. This is a generic form. Um, x is the variable of my polynomial. It's what we tend to use. And you can use any variable, variable you want, but I'm choosing x. And notice how it's a sequential path.
powers of x. It's the whole numbers, 0, 1, 2, and so on and so on and so on, up to some whole number n. And n is what we call the degree of the polynomial. And in front of each of these x terms, there is some number c, which I've labeled as c with a subscript that matches the exponent just to set them aside. That, that's letting you know they don't have to be the same. And they could even be 0, which means I might have some of these x terms in the middle disappear because the c value is 0. These are what we call coefficients. And that, in and of itself, is a polynomial. So what makes a polynomial so special or so important? Well, its true importance is really found in calculus. Uh, it's college-level calculus, but there's something called Taylor's theorem. And what Taylor was able to show was that any function can be well approximated by a polynomial, and that every function can be equivalent to an infinite polynomial in a neighborhood of a given point. What does all that mean? It basically means no matter how complicated or how complex a function is that you have, there is a polynomial out there which is much easier to deal with that is either very approximate or equivalent to, if we're willing to go to infinity, for that function that itself, and it might be easier to work with. And we're going to see some examples of that in a few future videos here. But for now, that underlies the importance of polynomials. So no matter what function I'm dealing with, it can somehow be related back to polynomials. Now, polynomials have a property that is called the roots, or the roots of the polynomial. These roots can be thought of as take any polynomial and set it equal to 0. Now, find all of the x values that will make that true, or the solutions to this polynomial. So if I can find a value for x, plug it in for every x here, evaluate it out, and then get 0, then that's what's called a root of that polynomial. And we can also graph polynomials. So if I think about, like, if you remember from school, your x and your y axis, you can graph these polynomials. And if we limit their coefficients, we restrict the coefficients to be rational numbers, then we can graph it very, very accurately using a technique called transformations. And we can then do a very accurate graph of this polynomial. And wherever that polynomial crosses the x-axis, then that's where those roots are, or the solutions to this equation. So we've got a lot of tips and tricks and tools that we can use with polynomials to find things both visually and algebraically. And so what we then do is we say, OK, it seems like polynomials are important. They're best studied when my coefficients are rational. So I then say, OK, I'm going to define algebraic numbers to be the roots of polynomials with rational coefficients. It's a lot to say, but that's what it is. So if I take any polynomial, so any degree n, and I plug in rational coefficients, whatever roots are possible to get, those are going to be the algebraic numbers. Well, what are some algebraic numbers by way of example? Well, let's start with the rational numbers. Remember, rational numbers can be written as a over b. So I'm going to create this polynomial right here, x minus a over b. That's a valid polynomial. I have x to the 1 with a coefficient of 1, and I've got x to the 0, because remember, x to the 0 is just 1 right here, and so my coefficient is a over b, and that's a rational coefficient. And then if I set this equal to 0 and then solve for x, well, all I do is add a over b to both sides. I get x equals a over b. Thus, it's a solution to this equation, which means it's a root of the polynomial, which means any rational number is, can be a root of, any, of a polynomial, which means all rational numbers are algebraic. OK, well, rational numbers include integers, whole numbers, natural numbers. So all of those awesome numbers that are much easier to work with, they're all algebraic. Well, what about some of the irrational numbers we've studied? Let's start with square roots. Well, we, we did find that the square root of any non-perfect square d must be irrational. So if I think like d equals 2 or 3 or 5, the square root of that must be irrational. Since I'm talking about square roots, I'm going to go ahead and use x squared, and I'm going to write x squared minus d. And that is a valid polynomial. Why? d is not the square root of 2. d is 2 or 3 or 5 or whatever. So it's a whole number, or a natural number more specifically. I've got a 1 in front of this x squared, so that's rational. Rational and rational, OK? And you can think of it as having a 0 in front of the x to the 1. It's just not showing here. So I can solve this by setting it equal to 0. 
and then I subtract d from both sides, I get x squared equals d, and then I undo the square by taking the square root, and technically I actually take the positive and negative square root, and I get x equals plus or minus the square root of d. That means that plus or minus the square root of d are the roots of this polynomial, which means they're algebraic. So the square roots of any non-perfect square are all algebraic. So irrational numbers can be algebraic. And likewise, I could do the same thing for cube roots, or fourth roots, or fifth roots. All I have to do is just replace this two with a three for cubed, or a four for the fourth, or a five for the fifth. And ultimately, I'm going to solve the same way. Add d to both sides and take the cube root, or the fourth root, or the fifth root. And therefore, they're all also algebraic. So we can see that algebraic numbers cover a whole host of things. Even better, imaginary numbers can be algebraic as well. Let's just start with the imaginary quantity i. All right? I can create this valid polynomial here, x squared plus 1. Now, it's, a, it's valid as a polynomial I care about because this is a rational coefficient, a rational coefficient in uh, whole number exponents for x. And then I set it equal to 0 and solve. Subtract 1 from both sides. I get x squared equals negative 1. Take the square root. Well, I'll take both square roots and I get x equals plus and minus i. Because remember, the square root of negative 1 is i. And so that means i is also algebraic. So there are complex numbers that are algebraic as well. So again, I'm really covering the gamut here. So, why, so now that we have an, an idea of what algebraic numbers are, how I can find them, the next thing is, is why is it that important to me? Well, some more advanced mathematics, which are beyond what I'm going to show you here, will actually show us that Algebraic numbers are closed, or I like to say completely closed. What do we mean by that? What I mean is take any two algebraic numbers and apply the basic operations. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, exponentiate, or take the root of. Pick any two algebraic numbers, you will always get an algebraic number every single time. And the algebraic numbers are the smallest. Here we're talking about infinity, so smallest doesn't really make a lot of sense. But intuitively, I think we get what I mean. They're the smallest completely closed set. If I tried to pick any other set of numbers that was a subset of the algebraic numbers, something won't work. Maybe I just can't take their roots, so I can't do the invert of exponents. Well, then that means they're not completely closed. Maybe I can add, subtract, multiply, divide, like the rationals. That's what I can do with the rational numbers. I can add, subtract, multiply, divide any two rational numbers, and I always get a rational number. But as soon as I try to do the inverse of an exponent, I run into situations where I won't necessarily get rational numbers, so they're not completely closed. So the algebraic numbers are completely closed. Well, if you remember from my number classes video when we talked about complex numbers, I said that's it. There are no more complex numbers. The reason being, the exact same reason as the algebraic numbers, it's a completely closed set of numbers. Take any two complex numbers, add, subtract, multiply, divide, exponentiate, take the roots of, you will always get a complex number. So it's also a completely closed set. So the next question we would have is, we know the complex numbers is the largest set of numbers that is completely closed, and the algebraic numbers is the smallest set of numbers that are completely closed. Are those two sets the same? Or are there any numbers in the complex numbers that are not in the algebraic numbers? Well, that becomes an important question for various reasons, mostly mathematical curiosity, I'll be honest. But the motivation behind that really came about around 1682 when Leibniz showed that from trigonometry, there's this function called the sine function. He said the sine function is not an algebraic function. Now, what does that mean? Don't worry about it. Essentially, it points to the possibility of non-algebraic numbers. It was not a guarantee that they were there, but it points to their possibility. And so that then drove mathematicians to look for them. And so then we want to give them a name, and we say, okay, if a number is not algebraic, then it must transcend the algebraic numbers. So we're going to call them transcendental numbers. Ooh, very meta. But what? That, that's just a name for them. We have no idea if they actually exist or not. And it took nearly 200 years for a mathematician named Louisville to actually show that there are transcendental numbers. He didn't have the answer right away. This was 1844, but he did show that they do exist. There have to be numbers that aren't algebraic, but that are complex. They still fit in that because that's the largest set. 
And then about seven years later, 1851, he finally was able to create a number, and we call him today a Louisville number, and that he showed that this number is in fact transcendental. Problem being, it's not a useful number. A transcendental number that he had to create that we never used in any other purpose before isn't really very helpful for me to go, yay, I found a transcendental number that I'll never use again. And in fact, the, really the biggest reason we use Louisville numbers is that if we can say a number is of the form of a Louisville number, then we know it's transcendental. But I have to go looking for that. What about numbers that I already have? Like, for example, pi. Is pi algebraic or is it transcendental? Well, one way to try to figure it out is to test it. Can you create a polynomial with rational coefficients that has pi as the root? And up to this point, nobody could. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Maybe the pi has a uh, maybe that polynomial has a degree of a hundred or a thousand or a million. Something we just can't get to very easily. Well, then, around 1882, a man named uh, Ferdinand von Lindemann comes to the scene. And he actually demonstrates something else, something really cool about transcendental numbers. And that's what we're going to focus on now. And this actually involves the number e. So if you think back to the continuous compound interest video, Euler's number, this limiting value when I take compounding periods to infinity, this number e plays a large role in transcendental numbers. He was able to prove basically this right here. Take e and raise it to the power of alpha, where he says alpha is any algebraic number other than zero, okay? Because zero is, messes everything up. So, and plus e to the zero is just one. So that doesn't give me anything fun. He says e to the alpha, where alpha is any algebraic number other than zero, must be transcendental. I'm just going to abbreviate this as trans. But he was able to formally prove that. It's known as the Lindemann theorem. e to any algebraic number other than zero is a transcendental number. And then he did something that was very cool. He said, let's see what we can use, how can we use this to tell something about pi? Well, all the greatest proofs start with assuming something about a number, so let's go ahead and assume pi is algebraic. Let's just assume that's true, all right? Well, we know from right here that i is algebraic, and we know that algebraic, the set of algebraic numbers is closed. So if I were to multiply pi times i, the imaginary constant, then that must be algebraic. Remember, that's based on the assumption that pi is algebraic because it's, it's a closed set, so it has to stay in that set of numbers. Then if we let pi i equal alpha, then that's telling me that e to the pi i must be transcendental. All right? That's from the Lindemann theorem. e to any algebraic number must be transcendental. So e to the pi i, because pi i is algebraic, must be transcendental. But Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler, again a name you're going to hear a lot from me, already knew this answer. He showed the world this has an answer that's very simple. It involves trigonometry, and we're going to ultimately get to it, a little bit of calculus, but for right now, just trust me, he said we can say this with certainty. e to the pi i equals negative 1. That is the value of e to the pi i. Well, negative 1 is a rational number. That's algebraic. So what we have now is that According to Lindemann, if pi is algebraic, then e to the pi, by, pi i must be transcendental. But Euler said, no, e to the pi i is not transcendental because it's negative 1, therefore it's algebraic. So what went wrong? The only thing that could have gone wrong is our assumption that pi is algebraic. Therefore, pi is transcendental. So what does that mean about pi? Well, it doesn't change the fact that it's irrational. We've already shown that all rational numbers have to be algebraic, so therefore it, being transcendental means it's irrational. So right there is actually a proof that pi is irrational. It doesn't change the way that its decimals look. They're still going to go into infinity, and they're still never going to have any sort of repeating pattern. But it makes pi more complicated. 
Think about the continued fractions I showed earlier with the 1 in the numerator and then those other numbers, 7, 15, 1, 292, 111, what happens next, I don't know. Well, it turns out that for algebraic numbers only, a continued fraction will have a repeating pattern. And so if it's transcendental, it won't. And so we find, too, that it gets even harder to give a nice little infinite representation of pi because it, we don't get that option to do that repeating pattern because it's transcendental. And additionally, if we wanted to try to find pi on a number line very, very accurately, the only way to do that would be a polynomial with rational coefficients. But by the definition of algebraic numbers, pi cannot be the root of a polynomial with rational coefficients. Therefore, it's not something we can graph with accuracy. It would be very, very approximated. And therefore, we cannot even find pi with a reasonable amount of accuracy on a number line. Yes, we can find it on a number line, basically, but it's the idea that it's a complete guess. It, it really is. It's not near enough to anything that we can get it very accurate. That's kind of what it means to be transcendental. Very abstract, but an important property of pi nonetheless. There's only a couple more things I wanted to show you, and then we'll wrap up Pi Day of the Century. All right, here are the last two things I wanted to cover with pi, just to show you some other areas that they show up that might not be as intuitive. And both of these are actually related to statistics. Um, the first one is something called the normal distribution. And you may be familiar with this in some way. Most of you probably heard it referred to as like the bell curve. And I'm actually planning on doing a future video on the normal distribution, so don't worry too much if you're not super familiar with it. But with this bell curve, the normal distribution shows up everywhere. It turns out to be probably the most important uh, statistical distribution possible. Um, it allows for statistics to work the way it does today um, and, and is an incredibly useful and, and proper tool to use in spite of what some people may say about statistics. Uh, but I want to talk about the standard normal. When we have a mean of zero and a variance of one, what does that look like? Well, as an equation, the standard normal looks like this. 1 over 2 pi times e to the negative x squared over 2. All right, so what does that mean, basically? Essentially, all that's trying to say is that as I want to, descri to describe the, the spread of data that's distributed normally, that this equation, where my data is the x values there, would, would map it out very well. But here's what I love about it. It's just the spread of things being not the uh, the average, you know, so, so we can take a collection of things where everybody's different, they're not all the same, but they're distributed normally, and this will define how their differences are mapped out, and look what it involves. It involves pi. This has nothing to do with a circle, and yet it still involves pi anyway. I think that's kind of interesting, and even more so, it also involves e, a number we've just barely begun to introduce in previous videos and I'm definitely going to spend more time with, but it looks like pi and e are very closely related, um, not only from the Lindemann theorem as well, but here with the normal distribution. I thought that was kind of neat. And one last thing that is completely counterintuitive, yet simple, and also very neat. And this is something called the Buffon needle experiment. And here's how it basically works. Picture like a hardwood floor where you've got a whole bunch of parallel lines, okay? So it looks a little something like this maybe. And I'm gonna take needles and one at a time, I'm gonna drop them on the floor and I'm gonna see where they land. Now, I know a few things about this floor. I know the distance between these parallel lines and it's the same all the way across. We're gonna call that distance T. And I know the length of my needle. So if this is my needle right here, I'm going to call its length L. I'm going to use a script L because I don't want it to look like a 1. And I know how many needles I have. I have N needles. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop them on the floor and I'm going to count how many times does a needle that lands on the floor cross one of these lines versus not. It just lands somewhere else. The trick is with this is that the needle does have to be shorter than this distance right here. So if it lands there, it does land like that. But this mathematician Buffon was able to find a really co cool equation that related 
all of these values right here. And it looks like this. Pi is approximately 2nl over xt, where x is the number of needles that actually cross the line. What? How in the world is that related to pi? And yet it actually turns out that it is. It involves some, some trigonometry that's non-obvious at first, but it actually is very related to pi. And so experiments have been done to actually confirm this, where we can use experimental data to generate a, a, an approximation for pi. And so if I had thousands of needles, and I performed this experiment one at a time, drop them on this floor, and count how many of them touched or crossed one of these lines, measure the needle, measure the distance between these per parallel lines, plug it into this value, and I'm actually going to be very, very close to pi. Again, not obvious that that would be the case, but it actually turns out to be. So I love that fact about pi as well. It shows up in an area that seems like it should have nothing to do with it, and that I can generate pi not by some crazy arctangent formula, an infinite series, or even a Ramanujan formula that's even more complicated or needs computer time that will run for days, but I can just drop a needle onto a floor and plug in some numbers and get a really close approximation for pi. And I think that's pretty cool. Well, there you have it. That's pi. That's some things about pi you may have never known and may have never wanted to know. Remember, today is pi day of the century. This will not happen for another 100 years. So at 9.26.53 a.m., if you haven't watched, if you've already watched this, great. I hope you celebrate it. If you've watched it after that, but it's not 9.26.53 p.m., then at 9.26.53 p.m., you better get excited and be thinking about pi. Because I said so. That's why. I probably will be the only person in the world doing that, but I will be. Well, that's Pi. And remember, you watched it. You can't unwatch it. It's obvious I'm wide and nerdy. Think I'm just too wide and nerdy. Think I'm just too wide and nerdy. I'm just too wide and nerdy. Look at me, I'm white and nerdy.